uh, we're going to dive into our message. Um, it is our New Year message, and I advertised it just like that. Finish strong, start right. And my, the heart behind this message this morning is this idea that anytime we come to an end of something and start something new, we want to finish the previous thing well, right? Whether it's a job, whether it's our church, whether we're moving from one community to the other, whatever the case may be, we don't want to finish on a bad note. We don't want to kind of limp to the end, but we want to run the race to completion to the best of our ability. Because if we're able to do that, we start the next thing better. And so this is the approach I'm taking to 2024. Let's finish 2023 well, let's bring the things that we need to bring with us, the lessons we've learned, the good things that God has done, and let's leave behind the things that need to be left behind. I always find it so interesting how many times people go from one church to the other and they're so frustrated because the personality type that they left, the reason they left the church in the first place, they show up in the new church and it's there waiting for them. Well, <laughs> it's because there's some unresolved stuff that we need to get through before we can move on and get healthy and get plugged into the new setting. So to help us with this morning's message, I have paper and pens available to anybody. I did send out a message saying bring your own, but if you didn't, I have paper and pens to anyone who is interested because there will be some interactive parts of the message this morning. So if you need a paper or a pen, Raise your hand and the gentleman will happily accommodate you. You can use the note app on your phone. I will make allowance for that. But uh, if you need a paper or a pen, uh, the guys will come around with that. Um, as they do that, <coughs> I want to start off this I want to start off this morning by celebrating the good things that God has done. What are the good things? As you look back on 2023, and no matter how tough last year may have been, something good happened, I guarantee it. I promise you something good happened last year. And so if you have something that you want to share, you want to stand up, I'm going to open mic. I haven't done open mic at church in a very long time, and this could go any way possible way. But if you have something you want to share and say, I thank God for blank in 2023, um, I will openly hand you the mic and celebrate it as you think about it. I did say last week that we're going to do this, so this isn't like I sprung this on you. I did warn you. Um, I have a written celebration item that I will read while we... Uh, while you think about it. Oh. Um, so here is the written response I got. 2023, what a year. Even though it was a challenging year, I did not walk it alone. So grateful that the Lord helped me through the surgery and also through the recovery. Many thanks to my church family for all the prayers offered up on my behalf. God is good. So that was our written praise report. Again, acknowledging that even though last year was tough, um, there was lots of good that came out of it. Anybody? Anybody at all? Thank you, my love. Um, this is a youth shout out because we have been just kind of hanging out, having lots of fun. And when Pastor Mitch left, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> because all you like all when you do youth, it's it's different everywhere. And so it was just kind of a year of getting to know the, the youth and hanging out with them, having lots of fun, doing some crazy things maybe wrecking the building a little bit. Um, but it was crazy how we finished off the year. Our last youth um, time, me and Jonah, I'm, I'm going to say your name. Me and Jonah, we just started going on a discussion, and then I've been getting so many little texts and just even like some snaps of kids asking questions and just being very, um, just questioning a lot of things, and it has opened the door to have better communication and better chats with them. And so I'm excited for the new year because we are going to be having some hard discussions, and I'm very nervous about it because it gets me uncomfortable, not just because of um, speaking, but also just 
things can be very difficult in this day and age where um, you don't want to push anything on anybody, but at the same time, you want to have those conversations and you want to be able to get them to think about it. And so um, I just thank God for the time that we get to hang out, be together, learn about each other, grow. Um, I'm just thankful for our youth workers, Matt Klemek and Brielle too. Um, I'm thankful for them and it's it's good and it's going to start a discussion for the new year. So pray for us as we have some hard discussions weekly and just it's going to be kind of an open book but it's also going to be a good time where um, we can speak life into them and then they can decide where they want to go with it. So I'm thankful for that. Awesome. Anyone else? I am thankful we had our first ever ministry expo back in September, and we have the largest volunteer team one church has ever had. And it's awesome. And you guys have all been awesomely involved and doing your part. And this just feels like the way church, the way God intended, was that everybody, we are a body, everyone has their part, and when everyone plays their part, things just seem to go a whole lot better. So I praise God for, for that. Uh, anybody else? I'll come to you, okay? If you don't want to stand up in front of everybody, I'll come to you, okay? I'll, I'll take that uneasiness out of the picture. Oh, perfect. I knew that would help. Uh, I'm thankful for a uh, daughter that graduated this year. <laughs> Uh, I'm thankful that, I'm not thankful that mom broke her hip, but I'm thankful that she's up and about and recovering, so that's awesome. And thank you for a great wife and a new grandchild and lots of things. That's good. Awesome. Thanks, Lynn. Um, daughter that graduated is code for empty nest. That, that's what that was, right? Right, Lynn? That was... <laughs> Anybody else? One more. Uh, uh, Everyone's being, okay, Shawana's going to wrap us up. I thank God for the summer that we had at camp and that more people were able to come to camp this year because the borders weren't slightly closed. Um, and the relationships and the uh, friendships that are made there. And if anybody hasn't been to camp or that you haven't been in a while, come. Awesome. Well, I hope, even though we didn't share this morning, and maybe if you want, we'll make time for tonight. Maybe we'll make time tonight that if you want to share some good things or... It's important to end a year on celebration, right? It's important for us to reflect and see the good things that God has done because sometimes it's easy to miss it. And God calls us to have a heart of rejoice, that in all things that we would rejoice, in all things we would give thanks and praise. And so um, my heart is that that would be our, our cry, that as we look back, and like I said, it may have been a tough year, may have had its struggles, but we look back and we see the good. Uh, the second thing that I want us to pause on and look back on is the grace of God. Is when it comes to things to celebrate, we should be the most celebratory, most worshipful, because God's grace is so rich and abundant, and it can be the one thing that should inspire the loudest worship and the first thing we often forget, especially when things get tough. This morning we're in Matthew 18. We're going to be going through a parable that I'm sure if you've grown up in church, you're very familiar with. If you haven't grown up in church, uh, this will be a new one for you, but it's important. I felt that this was a good teaching from our Lord and Savior as we wrap up the year and come to a new one. Matthew 18, the passage starts in verse 21, and in most of your Bibles it will be titled the parable of the unrepentant servant or the unrepentant debtor or the unforgiving anyways it goes something one of those titles uh but the passage goes like this starting in verse 21 then peter came to him and asked lord how often should i forgive someone who sins against me seven times no not seven times jesus replied but 77 times Seventy times seven. Just stop, stay there. Go back. No, you're good. This is all part of 
I'm out of control. It's weird. Now, to kind of appreciate what's going on here, uh, what Peter offers is this idea of how many times should I forgive? Seven times? Ooh. And then you see Jesus' response like, Peter, you're being really stingy. Come on, dude. At the time, the rabbis were teaching their students, if someone offends you, you only have to forgive them twice, maybe three times. And then after that, um, you can hold on to that grudge. You can be bitter. And <laughs> so when Peter says seven times, it actually in that culture sounds very generous because he is not only doubling what the rabbis are teaching, he's more than doubling. In fact, seven is often referred to as a number of completion. So in his mind, he has offered the perfect solution. When someone offends you, this should be the perfect answer. And Jesus responds with, no, in fact, if someone offends you, you should be willing to forgive them 70 times 7, or some say 77. The fact is, it's not about the number, it's about the magnitude. We should have unlimited forgiveness, especially towards those who come to us seeking it. But even if they don't seek it, we should have an unlimited capacity to forgive no matter how many times somebody has wronged us and then jesus launches into this parable this teaching about it so go on therefore the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him in the process one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars he couldn't pay so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt. Now, the NLT says millions of dollars. I want to just kind of give you a scope of how much this guy owed. Um, Joan, you can go to a blank slide if you could. Um, <coughs> millions of dollars, you figure, and then the response, well, we'll sell him, we'll sell his wife, we'll sell his kids, we'll sell his house, and we'll cover the debts. In, in our terms, that sounds like it should be enough. But what the debt that this guy owed was, in the literal translation says, he owed 10,000 talents. Now, 10,000 was the largest number used in ancient Greek calculations. And for their calculations, you couldn't get a bigger number. So as soon as the people that Jesus was talking to heard 10,000, they're like, whoa, that's a big number. And he said 10,000 talents. A talent was the largest denomination of currency at the time. It would have been equal to 6,000 days worth, or no, Yes, 6,000 days worth of wages. 6,000 days worth, 20 years worth of wages is what a talent would have amounted to. So everyone who's like doing the math, uh, and so, and no, 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 the point isn't the math. It works out to be about 150,000 years worth of debt. 150,000 years worth of wages working every single day to your bone. The one commentator said, it, Jesus might as well said that he owed him billions of days worth of wages. Because, and not billions of dollars, billions of days worth of wages. The point Jesus is trying to make is that the debt was absolutely impossible. So when the servant falls on his knees and says, be patient with me, it's impossible. There's not enough amount of patience for the master to give that this debt would ever be paid. And the point that Jesus is trying to make is that you and I are the debtor. That you and I have accumulated such a ridiculous amount of debt in the eyes of God, a sin debt, that we could never pay it. Why? Because the penalty of sin is death. You only get to die once. And then there's all the sin left over unpaid for because you, there's no good thing, there's nothing you could say, there's nothing you could do that would ever rectify the wrong that you have accumulated. 
Because when you think about it, every bad thought, every evil intention of your heart, every careless word, these are the things that Scripture says that we will be judged for. In fact, the standard is, Jesus says, be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. So what's the standard for entrance into eternity? God himself. And if we do not reflect God himself, we're not getting in. It's an absolutely impossible debt. It's an impossible state that we find ourselves in. And so in this story, when it talks about the king, it's referring to God. When it's talking about settling debts, it's talking about divine judgment. So all of us stand before God and we can put ourselves in a place of the debtor and we are in this impossible situation and because of what christ did on the cross by dying in your place taking all of your iniquity all of your sin taking your place in the judgment and the wrath of god your debt is forgiven how great and amazing is the grace and mercy of god our father because we often forget that we are the debtor in the story we like to be the guy on the outside looking in, seeing like, ooh, this is a pretty hopeless situation. No, actually, in this story, each and every one of us is the debtor. And God, in his mercy and in his love for us as his children, has forgiven us, wiped the slate clean, given us all a brand new beginning. Praise God. No wonder Paul says our hearts should be constantly filled with praise. Praise. But that's not the end of the story. And this is the part about leaving the bad behind. The story continues in verse 28. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me. I'll pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested, put in prison, until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king, told him everything that had happened. When the king called in the man he had forgiven, he said, You evil servant i forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as i had mercy on you then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart that's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Matthew 6, Jesus just talked about how to pray, and he says this, <clears throat> If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive, your, uh, forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus is making a really strong point that we can't miss. You have been forgiven an immeasurable debt. You have been forgiven something that is astronomically huge that you can't even comprehend the size of it. And this is the point of the parable. He is trying to paint this picture of how big, how immeasurable, how and then the second debt is insignificant. And this is where many of us get hung up. But the, what they did to me isn't insignificant. It hurts. I'm not minimizing how much it hurts. But what I am saying is you don't understand how much you have hurt God with the sin that you have committed. You don't understand the atrocities. You don't understand the offense. You don't understand how big it is. Because if you're willing to hold on to this comparably small thing you're missing the whole point and the problem is is that when we hold on to unforgiveness and we hold on to this bitterness it robs us of so much of life john corson oh and i don't have it because my 
tablet's not working. Um, hold, please. Let me see if I can find it really quickly. Oh, look at that. Whoo! We're good. Okay. John Corson, he's, uh, he wrote the application commentary. Great commentary if you can get your hands on it. He wrote this in concern in, in, about this passage, about this parable. He says, we all know people who are in torment and imprisoned because they will not forgive someone who's wronged them. They're small people in the sense that they're no longer embraceive and free. Instead, they're restricted, tormented, uptight, tense, angry, bitter, and harsh. You see, the Lord tells us to forgive not for the sake of the offender, but for the sake of, one, of the one who's been offended. Regarding confronting problems, dealing with issues, binding and loosing, Jesus says, remember that you are to be a people known for forgiving over and over and over and over and over again. Maybe you see yourself in this story. Maybe you've been hurt so badly that you just can't forgive. Maybe you're imprisoned, robbed of joy and peace, and you, know, and you don't know how to get out. The answer lies in this passage. The, kingdom, the king commanded that the servant remain in prison until he paid his debt. But how could the servant earn money to pay his debt if he was in prison? The only way he could get out of prison was to go to his master and ask for forgiveness. If Jesus says we are to be people who forgive over and over again, how much more will our Father forgive us when we go to Him and say, forgive me for not forgiving, Father. Change my heart. The great thing is is that He'll not only forgive, but He'll also forget. This really struck me when I was reading this. Because the reality is, is that if we're honest with ourselves, I think many of us have, maybe you don't, I don't want to like overgeneralize, but I think many of us have a seed of unforgiveness. And I didn't think I did until I read through and I read about how people who are unforgiving have struggled with anger and bitterness and they feel robbed of joy and peace. And I was like, you know what? If I'm honest with myself, I honestly feel that way sometimes. And as I prayed, as I sought the Lord, I realized that, yeah, there's some unforgiveness in there. And as the commentator said, and as I've often said in the past, is that when we hold on to this unforgiveness, it doesn't hurt the other person. It only hurts us. In fact, for those that are watching online, many people who choose to join church digitally is because they have a hurt against the local church and they refuse to come. Well, you're not hurting the church, you're hurting yourself by not being part of the community that your faith so desperately needs. You can't live your faith on your own, you need the community, and as long as we remove ourselves due to unforgiveness, our spiritual enemy wins. I would say that the longer you hold on to any, anything, whether it was this year or years past, the longer you forgive, you, the longer you hold on to it, the longer your growth, your spiritual growth will be stunted because all your spiritual enemy has to do is, hey, remember when? Hey, remember when this happened? Hey, remember when this person did this to you and you relive it and the pain becomes fresh all over again, the hurt comes back and all of a sudden you're completely derailed once again. Forgiveness has very little to do with the offender and has everything to do with the one who's been offended, regardless if they ask for it or not. We need to be willing to forgive just as Christ was willing to forgive us while we were still enemies of His. And so this idea of forgiveness is tough. Um, I want to share with you, <clears throat> forgiveness is an action. And this may be something that you need to put into practice all this year long. Um, But I want to give you three steps. If you're struggling to forgive somebody, I'm going to give you some action steps that I want you to walk through, put into practice, that will help you. Because one of the benefits of forgiveness is you find healing. Lots of people say, well, I have been so hurt by what they did. Well, the healing you're looking for is on the other side of forgiving them. Let me say that again. If you've been hurt by it and you need some healing, your healing is on the other side of forgiveness. As soon as you're willing to start the process of forgiveness, 
you're going to find the healing that you've been longing for ever since this whatever it was happened. So here's your steps. It's three easy steps. It comes from Luke 27, verses 20. Luke 6, 27 to 28. But to you who are are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Okay, if you're not willing to forgive someone, they would definitely fall in this category. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who hurt you. What are the three steps? Here they are. Do good to those who hate you. So find a way to do good to this person. As hard as it may be, find a way to do good to them. Bless them. Find a way to not only do good, but to just go above and beyond. Whether it's in your prayer time or it's in your greeting, just find a way to bless them. And third thing is pray for those who hurt you. Pray for them often. And what you're going to find is the more you do this, the more you put this into practice, suddenly you stop doing it through gritted teeth. Suddenly you find the healing that you've been looking for and you actually start to love that person again. The problem with unforgiveness is it's like a virus. Once it latches onto one thing, you become more and more willing to be unforgiving to more and more people. Or the person that you're not willing to forgive, everything they do just makes you upset. It's, it's a virus, it'll kill you, it robs you of your life, and we, as we come into this new year, those things I listed off, harshness, bitterness, anger, robbed of joy and peace, these are not things I want to take into my new year. These are not things I want to take into 2024. Those are things I'm more than happy to leave behind. So if I have to, I'm going to deal with it, I'm going to deal with it today, or at least start the process.